Three days before he died, John Lennon spent nine hours talking with Rolling Stone magazine about jumping back into the public spotlight after five years of being a stay-at-home dad with his wife Yoko Ono and their son Sean. At the end of the article, John said something which seems to be eerily prophetic now. I know we make our own reality and we always have a choice, but how much is preordained? Is there always a fork in the road, and are there two preordained paths that are equally preordained? There could be hundreds of paths where one could go this way or that way. There's a choice, and it's very strange sometimes. 41 years ago, on December 8, 1980, John Lennon was shot. His death is one of history's most shocking murders, but even more chilling is the idea that it was somehow preordained. John himself predicted it in a 1965 interview when he said, We'll either go in a plane crash or we'll be popped off by some loony. Four years after that, in December 1969, a BBC documentary crew captured a spooky moment as he read a bizarre fan letter warning him about an assassination attempt on his life. A prediction that came through a Ouija board from the Beatles manager, Brian Epstein, who had died two years before that. Now listen for yourself. Dear Mr. Lemon, from information I received while using a Ouija board, I believe that there will be an attempt to assassinate you. The spirit that gave me this information was Brian Epstein. <laughs> Eleven years later, that prediction came true. Today, the story is still baffling. How could a man who called John Lennon his hero end up shooting him to death? Why did he do it? Let's get into it. Good to see you. I'm Chris, and this is True Crime Recaps. Though he didn't know it, John Lennon spent his last day on Earth doing what he loved with the people he loved. In the morning, Annie Leibovitz came to the Dakota, the Central Park West apartment building that John and Yoko called home, to shoot the cover for Rolling Stone. And the editor told her to get a picture of John without Yoko, but he insisted they do it together. In the magazine, with the iconic picture of a naked John curled around a fully clothed Yoko, was the last image of the most notorious married couple in music history. And just three hours later, after the picture was taken, John autographed an album cover for the crazed fan who would later kill him, Mark David Chapman. Here he is in an interview with Larry King on CNN. Yes, I knew that morning, oddly, when I left the hotel, I, I had some type of premonition that this was the last time I was going to leave my hotel room. I hadn't seen him up to that point. That's what makes it interesting. I wasn't even sure he was in the building. And then uh, I left the hotel room, bought a copy of The Catcher in the Rye, signed it to Holden Caulfield from Holden Caulfield, and wrote underneath that, this is my statement, underlining the word this, the emphasis on the word this. I had planned not to say anything after the shooting. Walked. Uh, briskly up Central Park West to 72nd Street and began milling around there with the fans that were there, Jude and Jerry, and uh, later a photographer that came there. He came out, I was uh, leaning against the uh, gargoyle studded railing and uh, was looking down. I was reading The Catch in the Rye and uh, I believe he got into a taxi and disappeared. And then uh, later that day, uh, I had gone to lunch with, I believe, Jude. She was a fan there that uh -huh. uh, was there at the building. And uh, we struck up a conversation about Hawaii, about John Lennon. She'd been there a number of times. And at one point during the day, um, she had left. And uh, John came back out. I don't remember him going back in from the taxi, but... He was obviously back in the building. He was doing a, an RKO radio special. And he came out of the building. And the photographer that I mentioned earlier, Paul Gorish, he kind of pushed me forward and said, here's your chance. You know, you've been waiting all day. You've come from Hawaii to have him sign your album. Go, go. And I was very nervous. Now, let me cut in here for just a minute. The photographer he mentioned, Paul Goresh, later told NJ.com that nobody picked up any sign of Chapman being a danger. He looked like the kid that got picked on in the school playground. He looks like if you blew on him, he would have fallen over. If you cracked him in the jaw, he would get knocked out. There was nothing to the guy. Unfortunately, first impressions aren't always true. Mark was a dangerous and deluded guy. And... I, I was right in front of John Lennon there instantly, and I had a black Bic 
pen. And I said, John, would you sign my album? And he said, sure. Yoko went and got into the car and he pushed the button on the pen and started to get it to write. It's a little uh, hard to get to write at first. And then he wrote his name, John Lennon, and then underneath that, 1980. And he looked at me, as I mentioned earlier, he said, is that all? Do you want anything else? And I felt uh, then and now that he knew something subconsciously that he was looking into the eyes of the person that was going to kill him. Well, his wife was in the car, the door was open, and he's a busy man. He's going to go to a radio uh, or to his record studio, and he's talking to a nobody, just sign an album for a nobody. And he's asking me, is that all I want? I mean, he's giving me the autograph. I don't have a camera on me. What could I give him? He'd flown into New York from his home in Hawaii a few days earlier. He'd been stalking Lennon for three days. But get this, he wasn't the only star he ran into on that trip. 24 hours before he pulled the trigger, he cornered singer James Taylor in the subway station, talking a mile a minute about something he was going to show John Lennon. Now, he told the Telegraph that the 25-year-old male made him very uncomfortable. He was glistening with sweat, and his eyes were darting all over the place, dilated like crazy. I just knew that I needed to get away from him. As nutty as that is, here's another fact you won't believe. That tragic trip to New York was actually Mark's second attempt to kill Lennon. According to his wife, and yes, he's married, her name is Gloria, and according to her, Mark actually tried to do it two months earlier, but he stopped himself. He told her it was her love that made him change his mind, but apparently the shine of Gloria's love wasn't enough to deter him from murder for long, because there he was again in December waiting around in front of the Dakota with a gun in his pocket planning to shoot his idol. So, why was his wife okay with him going back to New York just eight weeks after he went there to commit murder? The simple answer is, she believed he wouldn't do it. He told her he'd thrown the gun into the ocean, but he needed time to himself to think about his life so he could grow up as an adult and husband. Obviously, there are some holes in that story, but to use John's words, we're going to just let that be for now. The point is, he lied. She found out the truth the same way the rest of the world did, on the TV news. So, did she lose her mind, divorce him, and get far away? She did not. You're not going to believe this, but she's still married to the guy today. After John signed Mark's album, he and Yoko headed to the studio to work on her single, Walking on Thin Ice. That's where they spent most of the day and evening. It would be the last time John Lennon would set foot in a recording studio. Meanwhile, Mark was battling his inner demons about what he was planning to do. I stand around uh, like an idiot waiting for him to come back. Well, the photographer left, I, in all fairness, I have to say, I tried to get him to stay. Uh, because? There, was, there were those that felt that I wanted him to shoot pictures of the shooting, which is not true. Why then did you want I, him to stay? I wanted him to stay because I wanted out of there. There was a part, a great part of me that, that didn't want to be there. I, I asked Jude, the fan, before she left for a date that night. She said no. If she'd have said yes, I would have been on the date with her. And just after 10 o'clock, John and Yoko called it a night, got in a limo, and returned to the Dakota. But they wouldn't make it past the vestibule, because there was John's devoted fan waiting for him. I was sitting at the inside of the arch of the Dakota building, and it was dark. It was windy. Jose, the doorman, was out uh, along the sidewalk. And here's another odd thing that happened. I was at an angle where I could see Central Park West and 72nd, and I see this limousine pull up. And as you know, there's probably hundreds of limousines that turn up uh, Central Park West in the evening. But I knew that was his. And I said, this is it. And I stood up. The limousine pulled up. The door opened. The rear left door opened. Yoko got out. John was far behind, say 20 feet, when he got out. I nodded to Yoko when she walked by me. She nodded back? No, she didn't. 
Um, and I don't mean to be so clinical about this, but I've told it a number of times. I hope you understand. John came out and he looked at me and, and I think he recognized, here's the fella that I signed the album earlier. And uh, he walked past me. I took five steps toward the street, turned, withdrew my Charter Arms 38 and fired five shots into his back. While the legendary singer lay bleeding, Mark was surprised that he pulled it off. Um, I didn't even know if the bullets were going to work. And when they worked, I remember thinking, they're working, they're working. I was worried that the plane in the baggage compartment, the humidity had ruined them. And I remember thinking, they're working. Meanwhile, the lives of Yoko and the other people around would never be the same again. She naturally, and I can't blame her, she dashed around the stair area. I don't know if it's still there at the Dakota today, but she just, you know, ran for cover, which is what anyone would do. Mm -hmm. John, uh, according to, to what I've been told, stumbled up the stairs and then I saw her come back around and then go up to the stairs and then she cradled his body. I don't think she screamed, but a few minutes after that, there was a, just a blood curdling scream from someone and it put the hair on the back of my neck straight up. What happened before the shooting, before I pulled the trigger and after were two different uh, scenes in my mind. Before, everything was like dead calm. And I was uh, ready for this to happen. I even heard a voice, my own, inside of me say, do it, do it, do it. You know, here we go. And then afterwards, it was like the film strip broke. I fell in upon myself. I, I like went into a state of shock. I stood there with the gun hanging limply down on my right side. And Jose the doorman came over and he's crying and he's grabbing my arm and he's shaking my arm and... He shook the gun right out of my hand, which is a very brave thing to do to an armed person. And he kicked the gun across the, the pavement and had somebody take it away. And I was just, I was stunned. I didn't know what to do. I took the catch in the rye out of my pocket. I paced, I tried to read it. I, I just couldn't wait till those police got there. I was just devastated. Minutes later, the police were on the scene. Now, here's one of the officers talking to Inside Edition about that unforgettable night. It was about 10.30 in the evening, and we were parked, my partner and I uh, were parked at the corner of 72nd Street and Amsterdam Avenue, and we heard a, uh, a call come over the air of possible shots fired uh, near the Dakota. We saw a few people standing around, everybody kind of frozen. My partner got out, he ran to one side, and I came around from the other side, and some fellow was coming to me at the same time, and he said to me, uh, officer, be careful, somebody's shooting a gun in there, they're firing off shots. And uh, that's when I realized that we had the real thing happening. We didn't see, we didn't see Lennon at that time. And I said to Jose, the doorman who I knew, I said, Jose, what's going on here? And, and he pointed in the direction of this fellow with the overcoat on, and he said, he just shot Lennon. So I said to my partner, Steve, I said, Steve, stay with this guy, put him up against, you know, put him up against the wall. I went inside and I saw Lennon lying face down on the rug, and he was bleeding profusely. I let out to Steve, Steve, we got a real shooting here. Better cuff that guy. There was no time to wait for an ambulance, so they carried Lennon to the back of a patrol car and took off, sirens blaring. He died in the back seat en route to the hospital. The surgeon remembered that night with Inside Edition. Take a listen. The first thing I remember that was a little out of the ordinary is uh, they, were, they paged me overhead to the ER, which they usually don't do. They usually they would call your beeper, you respond, you know, answer the beeper, they give you the name or message, whatever. The other thing that was unusual, he did not show up by ambulance. He showed up by a police car. He's in the back of a cop car. He gets put on the stretcher, wheeled down the hall. He's wearing his uh, brown leather jacket with a little fur collar. Uh, he had blue jeans on, uh, track shoes, and a, um, and a red t-shirt with oriental print on it. Opened his chest uh, and started giving uh, internal cardiac massage. Uh, the heart itself was intact, um, and 
the vessels above the heart were, were what, uh, what were injured, and we worked on them. We didn't know who he was. We just worked on them. And you get into a rhythm. Uh, you start pumping the heart, people are doing their thing, and someone starts going through these belongings. And at that point, someone says, you know, the driver's license, and I remember seeing a gold American Express card that said John Lennon. And up before that, someone said, hey, that looks like John Lennon. And I said, no, that, that's not John Lennon. You know, it's like doubting Thomas. It couldn't possibly be John Lennon. And, and then they brought out his stuff, his ID. It is John Lennon. And that's when I had my uh, OMG moment. The medical team spent 30 minutes trying to bring his soul back, but it was no use. He was only 40 years old and he was gone. At 12.20 a.m. on December 9th, 1980, the ER director made a statement to the fans and press that were gathered in front of the hospital. John Lennon was dead. Bizarrely, John was obsessed with the number 9. He was born on the 9th of October, and throughout his life, that number popped up over and over. Sometimes it was coincidental, like an address or a number of letters in a loved one's name. And other times he purposefully made it a part of an album or a song or even his son Sean's birthday, who also came into the world on October 9th. And even though he was attacked in Manhattan on the 8th, at the time of the shooting, in his native UK, it was the 9th of December. Just another spooky coincidence in a tragic story. By 2 a.m., as Yoko left for home, she had to make her way through hundreds of fans gathered at the hospital and in front of the Dakota, singing John Lennon's songs, mourning the loss together. As the news spread, thousands made their way to the Dakota to mourn the legend. So why did Mark kill John? To answer that question, we have to go back a decade when his fascination with John Lennon and the Beatles started in high school in Decatur, Georgia. But before we do a little time traveling, I need to take a quick break to thank today's sponsor. Don't go away. If you've ever wanted to make your home feel safer, there's no better time than now. This week, our friends at Simply Safe are giving True Crime Recaps listeners 40% off their award winning home security. We love Simply Safe because it has everything you need to make your home safe. Indoor and outdoor cameras, comprehensive sensors, all monitored around the clock by trained professionals who send help the instant you need it. I love how easy it is. We were able to customize a system for our home online in minutes. You can even get free custom recommendations from Simply Safe. And Simply Safe was even named Best Home Security System of 2021 by US News and World Report. These are Simply Safe's biggest discounts of the year. You can even get a complete home security system starting at just over $100. With no long-term contracts or commitments, it's a really easy way to start feeling a bit more peace of mind. Take advantage of Simply Safe's holiday sale and get 40% off your new home security system by visiting simplysafe.com slash recap. Again, that's simplysafe.com slash recap for 40% off your entire system. Hurry, this offer ends soon. From Georgia, Mark David Chapman moved to Hawaii in 1977 and attempted suicide. Now, when he recovered, he took a job as a maintenance worker at the hospital where he was treated. In 1979, he became a security guard and got married. Over the next year, he grew more unstable and dark. He was fixated on J.D. Salinger's novel, The Catcher in the Rye, and began to think of himself as the real-life embodiment of the book's jaded main character, Holden Caulfield. Bizarrely, Mark isn't even the first killer to use the book as inspiration. John Hinckley Jr. was also a big fan. He's the guy who tried to assassinate Ronald Reagan in 1981 as a gesture of love for actress Jodie Foster. So, what is it about this book that appeals to psychos? To put it very simply, so this doesn't turn into a book report, the book is all about feeling alienated and angsty and living in a superficial society that's full of phonies. So, you know, it's a feel-good story. By 1980, he bought a gun and quit his job. On his last day of work, he signed out of his shift as usual, but he wrote John Lennon instead of his real name, according to All That's Interesting. He spent his time compiling a list of celebrities he wanted to kill, and Lennon wasn't even the only Beatle on it. Paul McCartney was a potential target, and Johnny Carson, Elizabeth Taylor, and Jackie O also had a place on Mark's hit list. 
In the end, he said he chose John for the same reason most people go through a drive through or order delivery. It was convenient. But obviously, that was BS. The only thing convenient about the murder was his reason for doing it. Maybe it even got him a lighter sentence than he deserved. His defense was pushing for an insanity plea, saying he did it in a delusional psychotic state. But what could be more premeditated than flying almost 5,000 miles across the country with a weapon meant to take the life of one of the world's most famous stars? Although obviously the man had some severe mental health issues. In an interview with Larry King in 2000, he said, At that point, I was a walking shell who didn't ever learn how to let out his feelings of anger, of rage, of disappointment. I was a failure in my own mind. I wanted to become somebody important. I didn't know how to handle being a nobody. I tried to be a somebody through the years, but I got progressively worse, and I believe I was schizophrenic at the time. Nobody can tell me I wasn't. Just to be clear, doctors said he wasn't schizophrenic even though he talked about hearing little voices in his head, but they decided it was more metaphorical than clinical. He pleaded guilty and they gave him 20 years to life with the stipulation that he get mental health treatment while he was inside. And they probably should have taken away his library privileges too. Not that Salinger's book is to blame for anything. Uh, the real reason Lennon was a target was because Marx selfishly didn't think of him as a human. To him, he was just an album cover celebrity, a person he perceived to be phony, something he was angry at. He killed him to become something he wasn't, to become somebody, even if the only thing he'll ever be remembered for is something evil and twisted. At his 11th parole hearing in 2020, Mark got more introspective, saying, At the time, my thinking was he has all of this money, lives in this beautiful apartment, and he is into music representing a more cautious lifestyle, a more giving lifestyle. It made me angry and jealous compared to the way I was living at the time. It was just self-glory, period. Nothing more than that. It boiled down to that. There's no excuses. Of course, they still didn't let him get out. But he's got another chance coming up. His next parole hearing is scheduled for August 2022. Over the years, every time he comes up for parole, Yoko writes the board a letter asking them to keep him locked up. She thinks if he gets out, he'll come after her and John's sons. What do you think? Should Mark be released? Would he be a danger to her and others? Let us know in the comments while I give a quick thank you to today's sponsor. And don't go away. When I come back, I want to tell you about John's final resting place. The holidays can be rough. I find that it can be a relief to have someone to bounce things off of. With BetterHelp, I can communicate with my professional licensed therapist in the way that works best for me. I prefer video sessions, but if you like to text or talk on the phone, BetterHelp gives you those options too. It's safe, secure, and private, and you can start communicating in under 48 hours. No matter what you've got going on, BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. It's also more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at BetterHelp.com slash recaps. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash recaps. Now, on with the show. Yoko decided not to have a funeral for John. Instead, she asked fans to honor his memory with 10 minutes of silence. Six days after the shooting, tens of thousands of people around the world went quiet in a massive display of unity for the man who spent a lifetime writing and singing about peace happiness, and togetherness. Ultimately, he was cremated and his ashes were scattered in Central Park, in a place she could see from their apartment. Five years later, that area was dedicated to him as the Strawberry Fields Memorial. A black and white marble mosaic lays in the center of the two and a half acre field. One word is emblazoned on it. Imagine. Arguably one of his greatest songs ever written and a fitting tribute to mark his final resting place, a place where fans can go to remember him. But as they say, a man only dies when he is forgotten. And at the risk of sounding corny, as a John Lennon fan myself, I can say without a doubt that his music affected me and millions of people all over the world in profound ways. 
and it still does. With that kind of legacy, he'll never be forgotten and he'll truly never die. And that's your recap. Every week, my wife Amy and I are here bringing you all the crime in half the time. If that sounds good to you, I hope you'll give this a like and click subscribe and the bell so you never miss a recap. Thanks again for spending your time with me today. Until next time, take care.